All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Liz Kramer. I'm the co-chair of the CMC. Um, I'm recording this meeting for members and folks who missed this meeting. Uh, closed captioning is also turned on, so please do be sure that you are clearly enunciating into your microphone so anyone who needs it can see what you're saying. Um, if you ever have any other accommodation needs or things that you need to be able to participate actively in meetings, you can email myself or Christy, uh, and we will get that set up for you. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the Community Mobility Committee November meeting. Uh, we have a surprisingly packed agenda. Uh, we have a couple of late additions, so I am going to actually drop the agenda in the chat right now so that folks know. Um, so as a reminder, the Community Mobility Committee is a place for residents and interested individuals to advocate for and learn about mobility and transportation issues in the city of St. Louis. We ask everyone to be respectful in their conversations and questions. We're really grateful to have so many staff from the city participate in the committee. Um, and we encourage everyone who's participating to be respectful of their hard work and efforts, as well as varying opinions. Please avoid jargon and acronyms. If you're using a technical transportation term, please define it. Um, and ideally share a link in, a, in the chat. We'll also try to keep up with that. Um, None of our, not all of our members are necessarily familiar with transportation and our planning language, and we want to be sure that we're creating an inclusive space for learning. Please also be mindful of time. Um, we will be encouraging more follow up to happen outside of CMC meetings, both through notes and direct answers to questions. So we hope that will help us uh, keep our meetings focused. And then finally, I do encourage you to use the chat to share questions and responses. Um, we'll collect everything that's in the chat notes um, and make sure that that is captured. Um, I would like to ask our city reps who are here today to briefly introduce themselves um, and uh, say hello. Andrew, do you want to start? Sure, I'm Andrew Lackey and I'm the Deputy Commissioner for the Office on the Disabled for the City of St. Louis. And I will pass it to Scott. Good afternoon, Scott Ogilvie, City of St. Louis Planning and Urban Design Agency, Program Manager for Complete Streets. And that might be everybody at the moment. That's great. Thank you, guys. I'm going to drop in the chat um, the minutes from our last meeting. Um, so please do take a look at those. Um, there are no concerns. I believe Christy sent these out uh, yesterday as well as last week. But if there's no concerns, we will post those publicly today. Uh, and seeing Rachel's comment in the chat, I'm going to recognize Rachel to give a subcommittee update right now before we get into public comment. Um, and then we'll go into our public comment period. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. I have a new business opening on Grin and meeting with them today. So really excited to um, get that going. Um, Patrick and I both met with Chief Tracy yesterday and really had a great meeting. Um, based on our Safe Streets Committee meeting, talking about positive PR and what we can do um, to make our streets safer through PSAs. Um, Patrick is amazing that he has a lot of helmets. So we're going to be working with the police department to give them helmets to give out to kids. So when they're patrolling, they see a child without a helmet, they will be known how to fit them and to provide them a helmet. Also, any um, blinking lights as well. So thank you, Patrick, with Bike Works for providing that. It's great PR. Um, also, the chief of staff of uh, the chief, Tracy, um, and I are going to meet with the executive director of the Police Foundation to discuss ways how we can create positive PSAs with the police department on putting out to the public on getting people to slow down stopping at stop signs, not running red lights, looking out for pedestrians and cyclists. So we're going to have a great discussion with, with Michelle, the executive director, after Thanksgiving to brainstorm how we can get PSAs made and hopefully funded through the Police Foundation with the support of MoDOT and Save Mo Lives. So this is um, beginning of a great conversation. Um, infrastructure is improvement. Um, infrastructure improvements are important to our roadways, but what we all know that does not happen overnight. And also with the amount of police officers we currently have, we only have so many that can really help with traffic enforcement. So great ways with PSAs, with radio, TV, billboards, 
and just positive PR that we can put out to educate people about being safer, I think is a great start that we haven't accomplished yet from our committee. Um, and it's something that um, everyone wants to be bipartisan about positive PR, positive messaging with that. So I'm really, really excited that Chief Tracy really loved this. And thank you, Patrick, um, for being there and offering this support. I think this is a great step um, to move forward with. And uh, thank you to everyone on the Safe Streets Committee with brainstorming such great ideas on what we can do and move forward. Rachel, how can folks get involved and support you all in this? Well, I think the first step is for Monet, the Chief of Staff and I to meet, to make fingers crossed that we can get the support of the Police Foundation and get some funding. Um, and then it'd be, if we're gonna make some videos, be great with our, create a little focus group on what messaging we wanna put out there and um, what we wanna make sure that's in these videos. So probably creating a survey Eventually, we're going to put out to the whole group to make sure everyone's voice is being heard and what messaging we should put in these PSAs and whatnot. Um, but right now, it's just the beginning level um, with getting this started. And uh, the police department even admitted that they are not good with um, social media and that they haven't done a really good job getting messaging out and they are working on improving that. Um, Patrick, am I missing anything else from our conversation? No, I think you hit on everything. Yeah. So it's very new and it's just happened yesterday and just got the email last night back from Michelle um, about scheduling a time to meet. So she's really open to talk more with us. So this is very, very exciting. Um, we haven't had really PSAs out locally like this in a, in a long time. So. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel, for coming and giving this update before your other meeting um, and then keep us posted so that we can help plug folks in. Will do. Thanks everyone. Awesome. You guys have a great day. Okay, so thank you. Uh, so we are gonna um, open our, our sort of public comment sharing concerns time period. I think most of you are familiar with this. Um, we ask you to please limit your comments to two minutes or less. Um, and as much as possible, we're going to try to not have responses in this time, but we will be sure to follow up with folks afterwards. Um, and yeah, open the floor. If anyone has anything they've observed or would like to share or concerns that they have that have come up recently. Mike. Yes. Hey, Liz. Uh, Michael Reidenauer, uh, CMC member. Um, had a couple of comments from some of my neighbors asking about updates for the traffic calming measures regarding the uh, new cameras that St. Louis will be installing. Uh, the And uh, they were asking me, when can we expect this? And I kind of looked and shook my head and be like, I don't know, maybe you might know. <laughs> so I wanted to kind of bring that up to see like, when could we expect something uh, to hear something from the city? Uh, Mike, I will I, I believe Alderwoman Schweitzer will be joining us later today. The camera bills have not yet been heard in public hearing, but we should ask again. We have been asking for them to be heard in public hearing. So when she arrives uh, at this meeting, let us ask her that question. Scott, did you have something else you want to add? I was just going to exactly point out that those those bills have not passed. So at the moment, the, you know, the policy is in the hands of the Board of Aldermen, I think be hard to provide updates on timing until, you know, if and when that um, authorization passes. Patrick. Yeah, I had a question, I guess, for Scott on the updates that just happened outside of WashU. Um, I guess that's Skinker and Forest Park, I believe. Um, I, I was just curious, um, if we could get a um, some some of the rules, I guess, or how the city is applying the green striping for bike lanes. Um, it looks like we, I'm assuming WashU just put in green bike lanes that just go across the street and connect two sidewalks together. Um, I thought these were primarily used to identify bike lanes or crossings or, um, you know, and whatnot. And so I was just a little bit confused uh, and would love some feedback on, is this how we're planning on using these features in the future? 
Thanks. Sure. So briefly, just so people understand, um, Washington University funded some improvements at Skinker and Forest Park Parkway, which have been constructed over the last couple of months and have wrapped up now. Um, on three legs of the intersection, there are green markings in the crosswalks. So there's a green sort of bike crossing marking, and then there's a typical <clears throat> um, zebra crossing for pedestrians. Um, they did that uh, because one, there's a lot of cyclists using that intersection, particularly as they come to campus. So if you're coming from the north and you're going to campus, there there are bike facilities on campus. Um, in, if you go down Forest Park Parkway, just a little bit to the west, there's a bike facility. And I think a lot of people enter by bike from that southwest corner of the intersection and then enter campus. And then on the other side, um, you've got Forest Park is the, the park itself is just one block south. Um, so I think you have a lot of cyclists using the intersection. So they um, included those those markings now when they did the intersection improvements. And they are also, I'm not going to speak for them, but they're also considering in the longer term some other improvements within that region uh, that may further improve or enhance the, the bike connectivity. Thank you. Um, Kaylina, we will capture your question for later. Uh, that is maybe a bigger project update. Evie. Thanks, Liz. Hi, I'm Evie here. Um, I just wanted to say our, our Metrolink uh, running half trains right now is is a crisis in my view. And, and as I know that the Metro Transit and by state are separate from the city, but um, people are really suffering. I think it's like the regular riders as well as even operators in some cases speaking out. And I just hope that we can put whatever pressure on to actually restore service because we're basically working with half of what we had on Metrolink. Thanks. Thank you, Evie, and thank you for raising that um, earlier, right before they announced it. And um, we'll follow up with them about our previous request for that to not be a thing. It is terrible. Any any other comments or thoughts right now? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will follow up with Kaylin's question and, and hopefully with some more detail about the Jefferson and Shoto updates. Um, so I want to move us into some internal business. Um, we have a couple of things to cover today. We're going to talk a little bit about the bylaws. Uh, I'm going to make some announcements and we will do leadership nominations. So the first item to talk about, apologies, I don't have the right thing open. Um, is our draft bylaws update. I'm going to actually screen share. I know I don't normally do that. So the CMC has a set of bylaws that were originally drafted in 2019 um, before we were a formal thing. Um, and we recognize that we have some procedural changes to the way that we operate that are not reflected in the bylaws. So we wanted to take a chance uh, to uh, take the time right now in order to give just a little bit of update to ensure that we um, have bylaws that are aligned with our practices and that we clarify a couple of definitions. Um, we had a few things that were not quite as clear as we wanted them to be and that we we're setting expectations for members uh, and for subcommittees. So there, I, I'm Patrick, thank you again so much for making that side-by-side -side comparison. Um, you'll see that the bulk of the bylaws are uh, are pretty comparable to what they were before, um, but a few places where we've made changes that I'm going to highlight um, is clarifying the already adopted structure of voting membership and general membership, setting clearer term limits for what does it mean, when does a voting member have to reapply to become a voting member again, um, making a little bit more clarity about what the process of recruitment is, which was not clear at the time of our original bylaws, um, allowing 
uh, a little bit more flexibility within the way that we structure um, our elections and timing of those things. Um, and then finally, giving a little bit more definition to subcommittees. The subcommittees were initially structured as a, we could have them when we want to have them, um, but we have we want to structure them to make sure that they uh, have a purpose and a direction that they're pursuing and that there is some engagement and commitment to, um, to follow through on that purpose and, um, and direction. Um, and then finally, we because we are doing the voting that we do as a committee, we are doing primarily via email uh, due to the fact that not everyone is able to attend these meetings. Um, so we wanted to clarify some of the way that that happens uh, and make sure that we are still upholding the expectation that we have a quorum of a simple majority um, participating in any of those votes. So that is just a quick overview. Um, I'm not gonna leave this up and put this in the chat. But I do want to open up for any questions, concerns, commentary. I guess I should say what the next thing is. So uh, this last hour is our, our sort of open hour for comments from um, anyone about changes to the bylaws. And then we will move the bylaws to a vote of the current voting members um, immediately following this once we've made any revisions so that they can be adopted until they need to next be revised. Hey Liz, uh, Mike, it's Michael. Um, the only thing I could think of was, um, I don't recall any wording for if if um, we couldn't find a chair or co-chair for a re-election. I do re remember reading that it was a two year term. Uh, that was the only concern that I had. Good, so. apt concern, Mike. That's not in here. So that was it. <laughs> That's a great question. I don't know what that should be. Mm. Okay. Uh, if anyone has any suggestions to Mike's thought, I am open to hearing them. And otherwise I will go talk to Christy. The only thing I think of is a temporary co-chair or a temporary one until one is found. Okay. by random number generator. Um, I think that's uh, that's a, a great point, Mike, and we will think about how to address that. Any other thoughts? Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone who read the bylaws. Um, most exciting part of the CMC. So the uh, the next internal business thing that I wanna make sure that we bring up, um, we have a number of voting members whose terms are ending. Um, and of course we are also open for new applications. Um, the engagement committee will be meeting next week uh, to review applications for voting membership and move nominations forward uh, for approval. So if, if you or someone you know is interested in being a voting member of the CMC, um, please do submit a new application or an application period by Sunday night so that the engagement committee will have received those by their meeting on Tuesday. Um, and can review them. Otherwise, the uh, applications won't be reviewed again until January. That's more of an update. Okay. And then our final related, yeah, Patrick. So I guess the only question I had about the membership or your voting membership was you have some fairly strict rules about um, inclusion stuff um, that you are or are using, but is not part of your bylaws. I'm just yeah. curious why why that was omitted from this, but it's still something being used. Yeah, we have a number of policies that are not included in the bylaws, but are guiding the way the CMC is operating. And um, that those are what we 
what we have established in the bylaws is that the engagement subcommittee manages those decisions about policies related to membership um, and that they can adjust them as needed in order to fit their, their requirements. Um, so that, that was to give us some structure to make sure that the engagement committee has uh, has some flexibility to make decisions and to take input, which we we are very open to. Well, well, I appreciate the flexibility. I just want to point out that there's what two members on the committee, maybe three. I think they have a regular attendance of four to five. Okay, so but the point being that basically that subcommittee um, has the ability to change the rules for the overarching board. Um, that's a lot of power to be handing to a, a subgroup of, uh, of the organization. So not, not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying what it is, um, you know, and that's something to be watchful of. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I think that does raise, um, I think perhaps we could offer a bit more clarity about the way, uh, that those policies are changed, which I think is maybe not specified in here that if there are substantial changes to those policies or procedures, they do go back to the voting membership. And I think that's not as clear as it should be. Mike? I was just gonna add that I, reading the rules and um, uh, the two different rules that, that the voting members are voting on, I thought it was any change would have to be approved by, by a majority of the voting members is how I read it. So um, I thought it would prevent like an overall uh, like a takeover essentially of the CMC because it would have to be approved. Yes, that's correct. Um, yeah, and I think I think Patrick raises a good point that we should be more clear about how that the the policy change that is outside the bylaws how that actually happens. Great, thank you, and thank you, Aubrey, our co-chair of the engagement committee. Okay, so our uh, final internal business activity of the day, um, I think everyone on this call knows that I am hoping that this is my final uh, meeting as co-chair of the CMC. So we are accepting nominations, self-nominations, other people nominations for uh, leadership roles in the CMC. And we do that by you telling us that you would like to nominate yourself or someone else. Um, so I'm going to give a few moments if anyone is interested in nominating themselves. Hey Liz, I would be interested in nominating myself. Um, Aubrey, that is great to hear. <laughs> Thank you for your nomination. Are there any other nominations? Mike is applauding. Thank you, Kaylina. I guess I should say that uh, Christy has indicated that she's not able to attend this meeting today, but she has indicated that she does wish to be nominated to continue as co-chair. Okay, so the next steps for this um, are that we will ask uh, the nominees for co-chair to share just a brief uh, bio, which we will then send to the voting members to review and vote on. Um, the new co-chairs terms will begin in December um, and then continue for two years at a, at a, afterwards. Okay, great. Thank you. That's the end of our internal business. I appreciate you all going through it with us. Um, I am going to welcome Noah Goldman from STL Urbanists to talk a little bit about an initiative that they are working on. Thank you, Liz. How's my audio? Great. Great. Uh, so yes, I'm I'm Noah from San Luis Urbanist. Uh, we are 
for those who are not familiar, we are a grassroots advocacy group working to create safer and more effective infrastructure for pedestrians, bicycle users, transit riders, and even car drivers in the St. Louis region. Our, our movement aims to promote better urban design through education, organization, and engagement at every level. And so, so there recently we've been working on an initiative that we are calling the St. Louis Urbanist Speed Limit Email Initiative. This, so to start, this is initiative to make streets safer by lowering motor vehicle speeds. I'm sure everyone is familiar that motor vehicles traveling at a high speed presents a great danger to pedestrians and many road users. Um, and so we'd like to make the streets safer by lowering speed limits. Um, well, ideally the streets can be made safer by uh, changing the design of the road. This takes time and infrastructure. And it's, as I'm sure everyone is familiar, this is um, kind of going to snail space in this region. And so to accelerate this effort, uh, we're uh, starting an initiative to ask our members and um, people from the community to email our alders, our elected officials, to push to lower speed limits in the St. Louis region. And this will improve conditions by as there is real evidence that simply lowering the speed limit will lower the speed at which drivers drive, even without making any de design changes. And it will also allow our engineers in the city to consider these lower speed limits when they redesign roads. So um, I'm sharing this to uh, let everyone know who is interested that this is something that's happening. You can follow our newsletter and our socials to be aware of this development and uh, take part in it. Take part in it when we send out the call to uh, contact our elected officials. And second, I'd like to invite the CMC to additionally take a position on speed limits in the city of St. Louis. Right. Thanks, Noah. Um, I'm curious if anyone has. Uh, questions for Noah or thoughts about uh, lower speed limits? Yeah, Noah, I did have a question about the okay. St. Louis Urbanist uh, Society. Um, so you mentioned you guys are like a grassroots organization. So I'm wondering, what do you, what do you, what type of engagement do you guys do for with for your members do you do suggestions for like new laws or new type of infrastructure uh do you work like side by side with like city officials or is it like a grassroots campaign where you advise your members to contact uh officials so I'm just curious of how it works yeah actually uh now i'll invite uh rourke who is also a member to speak on uh, behalf of that group. He's uh, more familiar with this group and has been uh, working with it for longer. Yeah, thanks Noah. Um, sorry, I logged in on a device that does not have a camera, so um, so I can't show my face right now. But yeah, to, to answer that question, um, how we usually come up with different ideas that we pursue. Honestly, since we are a bunch of, yeah, individuals in a very grassroots, um, setting. Usually a person just brings up a really cool idea that fits our mission and then we kind of consent to it and we're like, yeah, let's let's roll with this. Um, that is how we started also our Adopt-A-Stop initiative and as well as the letter writing campaign that Noah was talking about, um, as well as, let me think of other projects that we're a part of. Um, the bench building that we help put together um, there are some folks that do, um, how do I say, work more closely with, um, I would say other organizations like TrailNet, but we don't have anything formal set up, if that makes any sense. Um, like we'll show up to meetings, we'll like get to know folks through things like this, but no formal connection. Thanks so much for that background on the organization. Um, Kia, yeah. you have a question? 
Yeah, hi. Um, thank you. I don't know if this is a question for Noah and Rourke or maybe for one of the professionals on the call, but I was wondering if you've done any investigation into what authority St. Louis has to set speed limits on various types of roads. Um, I know in other states like New York is in the middle of like a big battle to give New York City the authority to set its own speed limits. I know like other states, if it's a state-owned highway that is controlled by the DOT, it, it varies. Like, is this campaign like aiming to get the alders to do something that they have the power to do, or is it aiming to give them the power to do something? I just, I just want to make sure I understand the technicality of it. Yeah, I can jump in on that a little bit. Um, one great question. I do not have the exact answer to my understanding. I know that alders do have the power for, you know, local, um, local uh, policy, hopefully about speed limits. I know that it's been a while since I skimmed over their, the, the limits of their power. And so I guess long story short, not too sure. I'm hoping someone else might know, but that is something we can look into for sure. Right. And to add on to that, um, I don't, I also don't have a definitive answer. My understanding when I was doing research for this project was that the elders and the city of St. Louis does have the ability to set the speed limits depending on road type within the city. Uh, if there's any professionals in the call, I welcome them to share their thoughts on that. Maybe this, um, Patrick, I'm gonna get to you in just a second. Kalina wanted to know if you all are asking for lower speed limits universally or by specific road type. So I think this is, this is more based on road type. Uh, so something like neighborhood speeds should be set at 20 or even 15. And then our big arterials that are two or three lanes wide in each direction should be lowered from 35 or 40 to 30 or 35 or 25 in some cases where appropriate. Uh, but the goal is generally five miles, miles per hour slower than what they are currently. Great, thank you, Noah. Patrick? I, I believe we already have um, an example. We have one ward that I thought went through um, some rule changes uh, last year, uh, universally lowering the ward speed limit um, on residential streets. Um, uh, I can't think of the ward number off the top of my head, but I believe we already have a good example of this being applied. Um, you know, I personally would uh, be more than happy to jump in and help where we can and bring bring some of the B-Works power um, behind us. Um, lowering the speed limits, especially in the residential neighborhoods, would be huge for our, um, for our students. So however we can help, um, please let us know. Um, last thing was the the only other thing I would throw out there is that Rachel Witt and I had a conversation yesterday about really trying to um, coordinate some of these um, campaigns, I guess, whether they're coming from, uh, you know, St. Louis Urbanists or from Trailnet or from Beaworks or from whoever, um, and really sharing some of our social media power. Um, so I think this might be a good example that we could use if you guys were interested of how we can kind of um, get everybody's calendars in sync so that when we are doing this ask, it's coming from multiple different angles, um, multiple different organizations, and hopefully kind of lift the cause a little bit higher than us doing it individually or splattered throughout time. Right, I, I completely agree. I've actually been in contact with Trailnet to organize this, to or organize our messaging and timelines. And I, I'm speaking today because I want to do the same with CMC. But uh, if you can post your email in the chat, uh, we can talk after the meeting about that. That's great. That's awesome. Um, Cheryl, I'm curious if you want to come off mute and share anything about your comment in the chat about uh, the difference between lowering posted speed limits and lowering actual speeds. Sure. I know that there are many occasions on city streets where the speed limit may be posted at 25 or 30, but actual speeds are 
exceeding that. And so that's a distinction for me as a pedestrian or a bicyclist, just because uh, it's so common. And so you can have a posted speed limit of 20 or 25, but if the actual speeds being driven are five, 10 miles over that, then have you lowered the speed limit? Uh, how do you lower the speed limit? I mean, to what? When you're already at 20, say, for a neighborhood street. That's my distinction. And then there'll be people who really, um, as one police officer told me, if you put out the speed at 20, then there are those people who drive and they intend to exceed that that's what that's what they will do and so to me that's really the challenge is uh, w where we want people to actually drive and comply with the speeds thank you cheryl um i see a lot of additional comments in the chat this is all really helpful and um and, and i think also really helpful discussion on figuring out uh CMC support as well. So um, if you have any other thoughts, please do share them in the chat. I want to recognize uh, our one, one alder who is here. I thought Alderman Browning was also here, but hello, Alderwoman Schweitzer. Thank you so much for making time to come hello. see us today. Uh, so today we have um, the elder woman of the 10th Ward, Ann Schweitzer, who is also the chair of the Public Infrastructure and Utilities Committee. Um, I'm sure we have one million questions to ask Anne, but we asked her to come and give just a very brief overview of, kind of what's the role of elder people um, in transportation projects, in transportation work, and kind of what's happening in public infrastructure and utilities now. Um, and we will most certainly be inviting her and Alderman Browning, who I believe is the vice chair of the committee back to see us again. Thank you. Do you want me to talk now? Is that my cue to mod? It's your turn. Okay, fantastic. Do I have permission to share my screen? I will give it to you. Thank you. You have it. Awesome. Let's see if I can do this quickly. Share screen. Okay, everyone see this presentation? We nodded. We can see it. Okay, now I've got to figure out how to, I haven't done a presentation like this in a minute. There we go, did it. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I am Ann Schweitzer. I'm the chair of the Public Infrastructure and Utilities Committee. I was asked to talk just a little bit about how um, funding moves through um, from Ward Capital and how projects in the city get funded from, from Ward Capital. So I put together with my office, with my wonderful assistant, Christian Bishop, a presentation and the Board of Public Service was nice enough to look through it. Um, but if anyone is here from the city who has any flags about anything that is incorrect, please let me know. Um, this is my understanding uh, as an alder person of the process. So Ward Capital and St. Louis Works are two funding streams that are available for funding projects in the city of St. Louis. It's, it's, since this group is mostly interested in transportation and mobility projects, I've chosen to talk about Ward Capital and St. Louis Works. Both of those, um, both of those funds are available to alder people to allocate. Uh, and there's some extra information here about how those funds uh, came to be, where the funding comes from. Um, you know, you can see with the Ward Capital this this fund hasn't changed uh, very much in terms of how it works since 1993 and the St. Louis Works original um, street improvements fund was from 1971 uh, and hasn't received a ton of changes as well. Um, what can it pay for? So St. Louis Works really focuses on streets type projects. So paving, sidewalks, those sorts of projects are available through St. Louis Works funds, but Ward Capital has a lot more um, 
things that it can cover. So you may have noticed in your ward, if you live in the city, new street trees or when dumpsters get replaced or different traffic calming projects in the park. Uh, so many different types of projects can, can come from ward capital. Um, in my ward, I think probably the um, most kind of abnormal project I've had uh, requests for have been uh, decorative signage uh, to share costs with the Bebo Community Improvement Dist District, and then some of them that may be more obvious to you, like uh, um, allocating money for, for sidewalk infrastructure improvements or traffic calming in the ward or paving. So who's involved in this? Uh, a lot of different organizations and parts of the city um, are involved in ward capital discussions. Uh, to on a calendar year, um, when you think about how how ward capital is um, first, the decisions start being made really when uh, the alder person meets with their board of public service represent, representative, as well as a few other departments that regularly ask for Saint for ward capital or St. Louis Works projects. So meeting with parks and and um, and forestry, as well as streets. Um, the Board of Public Service, which I already said, uh, refuse. So there's lots of different folks that are involved in the conversations. Um, oftentimes what happens is in around between um, around May, generally, April, May, uh, the older person will meet with the Board of Public Service rep representative and those departments and they will say, we need um, this amount of money for, for trash cans in your ward, this amount for street trees, Parks might say, hey, we've got this project we want to do in order to do it. We need a 25% match um, from your ward capital in order to do that. So those discussions are made um, in a meeting and decisions are made in a meeting as well as sort of ongoing throughout the year as projects need to be funded. So I talked a little bit about this already, but you can see the allocation process. We made a little bit of a, a wheel here to show how the project moves through the, the system and, and what happens when a need is identified all the way to when the funds are transferred and finally the project actually starts. And this only really goes until when the, the funds are transferred. Then you have um, you know the actual project taking place. Um, but the older person really can be sort of the, the, the very beginning of, of the process to, to move things along. Roadblocks. I know that's something that we talk a lot about in this group in terms of we want things to happen very quickly. Why do things not happen as quickly as we might want them to? Um, so there have there's a lot of different procedures that take place in terms of transfer of how the money moves through the city and through the various departments. Um, you know, some it, paperwork can definitely get backed up in in ver in various places, and I, I don't mean to point the finger at anyone in particular. It's just that it does get backed up, and when that happens, project delays are inevitable. Um, because there is not necessarily a citywide plan for traffic calming or um, street improvement, especially, we don't necessarily have the plan as aldermen in front of us unless we make it ourselves really, uh, to say what streets in our ward are going to get paved when. Um, so that can make things slower, or I think end up with funds getting allocated to places that there may not be as needed there as they would be somewhere else. Um, and there's also a coordination piece with federal and state agencies. A lot of the projects that are funded through Ward Capital and St. Louis Works have a, uh, a, a state or federal match. A lot of times that means it's through East West Gateway. I think I saw at least some of you at the, the lunch here around, uh, at noon um, with East West Gateway. And they they are the sort of clearinghouse, if you will, for the the, the applications that come outside of the, the local funding. So um, a lot of times that just takes a really, really long time. I mean, all those applications are, are timely. There's, um, you know, 100 projects in the city that are in line for this sort of funding. And you as an older person may have a project that you want to do, but there's a pipeline, uh, they're expensive, and it, your board capital and St. Louis Works funds uh, may not cover and likely will not cover some of the, the bigger projects that you might be working on. Um, so I talked a little bit about the funding streams already um, and within the streets and with uh, our, our things that are funded by, by St. Louis Works and Word Capital. You may think about different state funds that come into play or federal funds, um, a lot of different um, options there for what other funding streams there are. There have been 
ARPA, American Rescue Plan Act allocations in the city of St. Louis for traffic calming and paving projects, some of which are in my ward and I'm very excited about. Um, and so that is another way that a lot of this has been, is being funded currently. Um, more funding streams, other funding streams. One of the things that has come up so many times that I've heard from members of this group is that even if every single dollar of ward capital was spent on paving, it wouldn't be enough money to pave the streets as regularly as as um, as experts say the streets will need to be paved. Uh, so that is a, a flag for sure. So you know that's why when you have a limited amount of money, it's just even that much more important to be really thoughtful about how the money is spent and to make sure that you are planning and that you do have a process for spending the funds so that they can be spent um, wisely and that future funding streams aren't necessary. But it does seem that um, there isn't enough money necessarily spent in the city of St. Louis on some of these, these projects. So um, that is something that I'm certainly working on and aware of in terms of ward capital and St. Louis works funds to make sure that those funds that do go towards these projects are being spent in a way that um, makes sense and is future, you know, forward thinking and planned out and everything. So um, that the funds we do have are, are able to cover the costs. Uh, so that is my very brief presentation on Ward Capital. I am so happy to answer any questions about um, my experience as an older person or um, anything that you all want to talk about in terms of Ward Capital. Thanks, Walter Roman Schweitzer, for that overview. It's really helpful. And I think especially as a reminder about how these processes work. Um, we did actually have a non-ward capital question for you that came up during our open public com comment. I'm going to summarize it, Mike, for you, uh, which was, which I think you've actually already heard from me, but we are curious about what the status is of board bills 105 and 106 related to the cameras. Um, there's a lot of enthusiasm for having a public hearing and seeing those move forward, and we're curious on what's happening. Uh, so the talk around the office is that there's a goal of having um, simultaneous legislation about how um, these sort of surveillance programs are used and the um, around surveillance procedures in general and wanting to have those things moving at the same time. Um, that is that is what I am hearing on terms in terms of a delay, but I will circle back and see if I can get something that's that's clearer. We're happy to provide this comment in writing to you and also to Alderman Cohn, who we have reached out to as well. But I think we are feeling in this committee is that this is one of many, many things that we could utilize to uh, rapidly improve the conditions on the roads. And we'd love to see it implemented sooner rather than later and not to have um, a delay to try and align with other other initiatives that are ongoing. That makes sense to me. Great. Are there other questions? I'm happy to have the hearing as soon as the sponsor's ready for it. Great. We'll we'll uh we'll write him another note also. Uh other questions for the elder women. We have a few minutes. Kia. Hi. Um so I know there was a little bit of an effort I testified a while ago about uh, reforming the ward capital system, perhaps like centralizing a lot of those funds uh, under the streets department, since that's where a lot of the money ends up being spent anyways on our roads. Uh, can I ask an update on where, where those conversations have landed? Um, if that is something that is still in the cards? I, I'm just curious. Sure. I think I've been spending a lot of time um, just researching and learning a lot about how all of these funds move through move through our system and how uh, it ends up showing up for, for us who are using the streets. And one of the things that keeps coming back is that there is not a plan for paving in the city of St. Louis. Every year, aldermen are given a list of streets um, suggested to be paved, but it's based on a Citizen Service Bureau re complaint or an aldermanic request. It's not based on any sort of, you know, here's our five-year plan and this year one, we're doing this and year two, we're doing this. And, and now year two is year one and so forth and, you know, forever. Um, which is how I tr believe that our streets should be operated in the city of St. Louis. Um, so right now, my goal is really to work with the streets department to 
put in place this system of planning so that we aren't doing funding the streets the way we are in terms of we're funding the board of aldermen are basically funding streets that they want to have done and and unless they're out there driving around themselves ranking their streets and putting an, an, an order in, in together for a plan it's not it's not happening um so at this time i am not personally comfortable saying okay well now aldermen just aren't involved go forth because there is no plan um, so the fiscal responsibility to me as an older person is to figure out a way to use this money better. And right now I don't feel comfortable. I would not feel comfortable voting to say we're taking our hands out of it because there isn't a plan. So until there is one, um, that's not going to be something that I'm super excited to work on. Um, but I, I, your point is well taken. Uh, and I think that it needs to be a collaborative effort to show that there is that that this is a uh um something that they should 100 percent be running because what happened for me my experience is i got a list of three streets from streets that they said i should repave holly hills delore and alley on bates i said to the streets department i'd actually really like to drive around the ward and get a sense of of the condition of the streets and talk with someone who's an expert on this and you know make a plan so they told me the streets to repave, right? It was a few hundred thousand dollars of, of taxpayer money. I drive around with the streets department and they say, actually, Holly Hills needs some maintenance, but it doesn't need to be repaved. Delore definitely needs to be repaved. And this alley on Bates, the problem here is a drain that MSD needs to install, not repaving. So here I am in a situation where I was just asked to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that is not even what they're going to be recommending. And, you know, that is not okay at all. So until we solve how that works, uh, I'm not going to just be like, okay, whatever you all want to do. Because what they gave me was bad, incorrect, wrong, not good, hundreds of thousands of dollars of mistakes. And that is not, you know, so I, I don't feel comfortable at this time. That's a long answer to your question. But at this time, I'm not, I'm not trying to just not have any involvement in it. And just to clarify, we're not just talking about repaving. We're also talking about traffic calming efforts to save lives, right? You you mentioned driving and paving a lot in your comment. I just wanted to. Well, you said to hand it over to the streets department. So what the streets department isn't even the the division that you're really talking about in terms of traffic calming. The board of public service is what is working through the traffic calming and the you know when I've had bump outs installed or um, studies done. The streets department's really not involved in that at all. Um, and that is part of um, the concern, too, I think, is that if we give all the money to the streets department and we just have paving and the Board of Public Service, I mean, the Board of Public Service was not given the list of streets to repave at the same time I was. So there wasn't that level, already baked in level of coordination um, that they were saying, OK, well, hey, these streets now need these curb ramp replacements. What bump outs can we what traffic calming can we do simultaneously? I'm having to behind the scenes coordinate that. Um, I just I, I so I'm I guess to your point, you know, if aldermen were to step out of that completely, would it improve if we just said we're not going to have anything to do with this anymore? Um, to add to, to Ottoman Schweitzer here, I traffic calming is more complicated than paving. Uh, paving is almost easy to do compared to getting traffic calming done. Uh, it really would just have to be like, you know, pave this street, here's some more capital, and then they'll do it when they, you know, can get it on the schedule. But for traffic calming, we don't have in-house traffic calming design. So often they'll come back and say, we need to do a study first. That puts a year plus on the calendar. Uh, it is extremely frustrating. They 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 resist efforts to. If you draw, I've I've driven up, drawn up my own plan. I've had Trailnet help me draw plans. I've submitted them. They say, well, we have to we have to not do that. We have to do our own thing. And so they they don't really. It does not move quickly, and there's no urgency there uh, to save lives. Uh, and, and that is as frustrating to us as it is to you. Uh, I, I, if, if we sound frustrated, it's because we are, um, we understand that this is extremely important, but you know, the structure of our city is not built for the 21st century. Uh, that's just the, the straight truth of it. And 
we need to really look at having a comprehensive department of transportation that actually oversees uh, everything traffic related, everything transport related. Uh, but right now those duties are separated between streets and BPS. And that is part of what makes this so difficult. So we're right up at the top of the hour. And I know there are many questions for the Alderman and the Alderman, and we're really grateful for your time. And as we have communicated to you over email, we'd love to have you back in the new year when your schedule hopefully aligns more with the CMC meetings for more in-depth discussion about some of these directions and, and topics. Um, Liz, can I say one more thing real quick? Yeah, absolutely. I just want to say none of what I said, I you know, is a reflection of, I mean, the Board of Public Service is very responsive. They want to work on these things. Um, you know, this is a uh, a hugely joint effort. The Streets Department is at the table. They want to have a plan. They want to do things differently. Um, but, you know, we but to make these big sweeping changes that I think some people are suggesting, it's acknowledging where we're at and what is happening now in order to create a foundation that will actually allow for these changes to happen in a way that makes sense and doesn't waste any more of your money. Um, so I really appreciate all the things Michael said because he really hit the nail on the head. Thank you for, for allowing us the time to talk. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great, thank you all so much. So I just wanna say a couple of closing remarks and uh, acknowledge to Aubrey as our engagement chair that hopefully I covered your engagement updates. Uh, the engagement committee is meeting next Tuesday. So if you want to join the engagement subcommittee, anything else you want to say? Um, it's probably going to be the last uh, meeting of the year, most likely. So if anybody wants to reapply for to be a voting member, begin to apply any of those things. If you want to do it before Tuesday, you can hear back before next year. Continue doing that. Um, as a reminder, we have a Google group. I'm gonna put the link in the chat and the policies for posting. So if you're new to the CMC, that's a place to find out what's going on and stay up to date on our list. Um, and then as a final reminder, our last meeting of 2023 will be on December 13th. That's slightly earlier than our normal meeting. Um, and we'll be reflecting back on the past year. Scott. Liz, I just wanted to make sure we give you a round of applause before we adjourn or your top-notch leadership for the last two years. It's been exemplary. Thank, you, know, thank you so you. much. It has been a great pleasure and I'll probably still be around. And I hope that you have a great time with your new co-chairs. Okay, great. Thanks everyone. Maybe someone else can be in charge of the opening music in the future. Have a great afternoon. Take care.